Well, all right. Happy Wednesday, everybody. Welcome to another Gen City Labs LinkedIn Live episode today entitled The Power of People, The Role of Community and Brand Narratives. Uh, if you guys are joining us for the first time, we do this every couple of weeks. Typically, we'll have special guests and various topics in the events and marketing universes, the crosses between technology and community and um, activations and all sorts of other fun stuff. Uh, we are broadcasting on LinkedIn. Typically, we're also at the same time on YouTube, on X. Uh, we are recording this, so if you're watching this at some point in the future, we appreciate your attention. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Mike Shaman. I'm CEO of Gen City Labs. Uh, with me from the GCL team, our head of marketing, MK Granados, as well as Eric Arvai, our head of strategy. And today's special guest is Liz Lathan, co-founder of the Community Factory, caretaker of ET Community. Shoot, I Good try. thank so you. Close. I know it. I knew I was going to get there. Um, and. You know, Liz, the reason that that we're really excited to have you on today is community has kind of become, uh, you know, community has always been an important thing, but it's really kind of come to the fore of the marketing um, uh, world over the last year or so. We've really seen uh, both in real life communities and digital communities forming, coalescing, and, and uh, really looking forward to diving in with you. Uh, before we talk about topics. Tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved in the event space and what you're doing now. Tell everybody who you are. For sure. Lori. Thanks so much for having me here. This is super duper exciting. My name is Liz Lathan, co-founder of the Community Factory and caretaker of Club Ichi, also Team CMO. Those are two of the communities that we take care of and invite people into. My background is 20 years corporate events. I was at the Fortune 500 event world and then left to join the dark side and create an experiential agency. Exited that last year though, when I realized that my passion is not about creating the boxes that people come into, it's about what happens inside the box. So uh, my business partner, Nicole, and I launched the Community Factory July of 2022 to really focus on bringing people together inside those events. So what are they doing? How are they networking? People need a networking wingman. You can't just turn on the music and hand people alcohol and hope that it's going to work out. You need a little more than that. And that's what we're all about. Amazing. Uh, you know, what drove you to, and, and was there a point at which you had the epiphany that's like, oh my God, people are doing, I get this all the time, people are screwing this up. There's a major opportunity here. We have 50, 100, 500 people who can extract a ton of value from being here with other people and they're blasting loud music and there's alcohol and there's nothing there to incentivize them to go. What was your moment of clarity when you're like, oh my God, I need to be involved in this and I can, I can do something to make this more valuable? So it was 2016. I was sitting at a corporate uh, well, it was at an event industry event, actually, which is, of course, really difficult for event professionals to try to nitpick everything. Um, but it was the same thing for seven years. And I was on the board of directors. I'd been president. And we, I was trying, like, keynote, breakout, expo. It's the same thing. And uh, some friends and I were sitting in the little coffee break area having a great conversation. And the girl with her xylophone came around. Ding, ding, ding. Time to get back in your session. Ding, ding, ding. And we're like, actually, we're good. We're having a great conversation here. And she's like, well it's really light in the sessions and we could use some more bodies. <laughs> like, oh, well, that's not going to get us in there. So we decided that if the events weren't going to change, we were going to change the events. And so we created this event that was all about people talking to each other. The whole agenda was no agenda. It was, we've got the sticky notes, we've got the Sharpie markers, you tell us what challenge you're trying to solve, and then you tell us what challenge you've solved and can help someone else with, and that's what the content will be. So we invented this idea, it was taken from the unconference concepts of the 80s, um, and kind of the open, um, what's it called, design thinking type of stuff that we were doing at IBM, and, and put it together into, let's just make all of the content this way. Um, and so we launched that in 2017 just for ourselves, for the event industry, and it kind of turned into a thing. And so now the Community Factory, that's really our bread and butter, is bringing those, we call them spontaneous think tanks and putting people together inside big events, right? You just need to create these micro event moments inside the larger events in order for people to find their tribe 
to solve their problems and not just sit and get for three days. Awesome. I love that. And I love that the brands are opening open brands and events are open to acknowledging that that's a gap that it's hard to probably acknowledge that you're not doing well or that you don't have a really thought out community strategy or way of creating something cohesive that lasts longer than your event. Uh, those are all challenges they're facing, but whether they've triaged them as much as they've triaged cutting carpet costs or whatever, it's, yeah. it's a different challenge. Well, there's two conversations we have around it. And one of them is the, the no thank you conversation because it's, well, we tried birds of a feather sessions and they never work. Or we put table topics out at lunch and no one ever talked about them. And so it's, you can't, again, you can't just leave people to their own devices. People aren't built that way. So they just don't want that to happen. Once you start to put in some facilitation around it and help people find the solutions to their challenges, then that's when they actually get interested and, and have some fun with it. Um, and so that's the first conversation is that no, because it didn't work last time. And then the second conversation is, well, crap, all of our post event survey results are actually telling us that what the people want the most from our events is networking. And we didn't build any time for that. We don't know. We, we just made the receptions longer each night. And that's not what the people want. They don't want to stand around with loud music and alcohol and try to find other people. They want it to be curated and facilitated a little bit more. So um, it's it's cool because we started this, like I said, in 2017, doing all of these things. And really, it wasn't until after COVID that, that the attendees started speaking up and going, oh, my God, I'm just I can get my content on YouTube and on podcasts. I don't need to fly out to your event in Vegas to sit in a darkened keynote room for three days. I, I'm, I'm flying out there because there are other people there. We went to an event, I want to say it was um, 2019. It was Fast Company's Impact Council. One of the, it's a massively mega, amazing, wonderful event, beautifully incredible luminaries on stage and absolutely zero time to talk to any of the other participants. And I was like, oh my God, what a miss. I'm sitting here with the people from like the, what's the glasses company, the um, Warby Parker, like all the, these amazing people, but they don't let you talk to any of them. You, you go into a room, you listen to them, and then you go to another room and you listen to them. Like, yeah. <laughs> One of the other trends I'm seeing, I'm seeing like lots of posts on Reddit in different communities of young professionals who came of age professionally through COVID. Maybe it's their first time getting to go to the conference because they're now at a middle stage in their career as opposed to the entry level, or they're in college and getting their first opportunity to travel on a youth program or something, they don't know how to network. They don't know how to break the ice. They're terrified going into an event of the blank canvas that is the networking hour without having any structure or idea of- Dude, like, I've been doing it for 20 years, years and I'm terrified to go into those events. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I hate them. So, but yeah, I think that being able to bring people together for a shared experience, a shared project and let them do it. And even if something as simple as sticky notes and Sharpie markers become a shared project because you just invite people over and go, hey, what are you trying to solve today? And they start writing it. They step back and start seeing other people's and it allows them to have a conversation more naturally than to grab something with their cheese cubes and look for an opening, you know, to try to get into it. So it, we call them, like I said, we call them event wingmen because I think having this moment allows that connection connection that people who are introverts or extroverts that just don't like to be thrown in allow them to get together. So how much of that is, uh, you know, during the event and how much of it is sort of pre-event? Because, like, you know, to, to curate the experience so that everybody sort of has a meaningful uh, interaction or a meaningful connection that they can find, you kind of have to get to know them a little bit. Um, um, but, I, you know, so the question is, like, how much of it do you gather before and how much of it do you do at the start of the, the event? So we attempt to gather before, but I will tell you, no one is thinking about your event until they get on an airplane to come to your event. Yeah. So yeah. we ask them in registration what challenge they're trying to solve, and we ask them what challenge they've solved and can help someone else with. But we don't use that information because by the time they come to the event, if they registered a month in advance, they're solving different challenges now. So it helps us kind of plan the conversations we may have and where we may lead them. But then we do it all over again in person because like we did one that the registration opened before GDPR launched. Right. And then all these people had questions. Yeah. By the time we got on site, people were just like, GDPR, what are we going to do? So anything that they had submitted was pointless beforehand. 
and the conversations were all about solving their problems. So it's, it's cool to be like right on top of it. And then what we love the most is you just get the wall of woes, right? So if you're a company putting this on, asking people to put their challenges, you just built out your editorial calendar for the next 18 months of every challenge your attendee has. Like it doesn't take a lot of money or it just takes a teeny bit of charisma and a, a willingness to ask a question and hand them a Sharpie and you've got everything. Yeah. I low key feel like that's how it was submitting for South by Southwest, uh, having to land on a topic in July for an event the following right. March, where I was like, anyone who's talking about AI, you're full of shit in your event description pitch, because <laughs> we know it's going to change so rapidly by next March. Yeah. So there's a cool question here from Lauren asking about the CMP designation, helping prioritize attendee needs over event logistics. And I think that um, the CMP, I'm ancient. So I took that thing like a long time ago before they put in anything about actual attendee experience. It was definitely focused on logistics. So I think for me, that CMP designation helped me think through from a hospitality standpoint, what attendees need, but from a an actual human experience standpoint, it didn't extend into that realm. That was much more in the um, kind of over the last, I would say, 10 years of really thinking about the buyer journey, the attendee journey, and putting that layering it on top of what the CMP designation teaches you. You know, I have found that with very simple tweaks, some ineffective ways to connect with other humans at events can change dramatically, right? And this is, I, I will, everybody on the GCL knows team already knows this. One of my biggest pet peeves is loud music at happy hour events that prevent you from talking to one another. Worst. Like, uh, sorry, my dog. Is <laughs> but I love puppy parties. That is like the yeah. best part of That's it. That's right. The puppy and she knocked my entire computer off. Um, but, you know, what are some little things that event marketers can look at, like the volume in the room, that are simple tweaks to existing programs that right now they may not even be aware of preventing individuals from connecting with one another, um, but are things that they could do that could have a material impact on the value that attendees are getting in, in their ability to meet with one another? Yeah, my number one pet peeve is the event registration experience on site. You come mm -hmm. to an event, you stand in a really long line or no line at all because they've made the whole thing touchless and it's just a kiosk with no humans. And so you go get your stuff and then you look around, but there's no other people there because it's not an experience. And so then you get on your phone. So you walk in and see a bunch of people holding badges and on their phones. What kind of a welcome is that? It's your first moment that you came into the event. This should be like a promenade. This should be an opportunity for your ambassadors to be there welcoming people in. Freaking let your exhibitors come take that moment with you. Like they want to talk to people, ask them, hey, the boots are already set up. The exhibit hall is not open yet. Would you come hang out and register? and just welcome people in for us. Like if you can make that like, like you would when you're going into, you know, um, uh, any sort of sports event where they've got tailgating and people are having this moment before the moment begins, why aren't we embracing that more with events? I think it's a really simple tweak that you can make. Um, and I also think the same thing with post events. I think we're missing that. Remember the exit through the gift shop mantra. Why aren't you letting the exhibitors bring their leftover swag and hand that out as people leave instead of mm -hmm. trying to give it to other exhibitors after the show floor closed? <laughs> Why aren't you like taking pictures and letting the paparazzi thing happen at the beginning of the event during registration and then giving out those pictures as people leave? Like you, when you go to a magician in Branson, Missouri, they take your picture and then they friggin' sell you the picture before you leave at the end of the day. So put some of those things into the event. And I don't think that they take a lot of effort. I love it. Yeah. No, the, A, brilliant. Um, and, and B, you know, your comments on registration also hit at the heart of another one of my pet peeves, which is the state of event technology, um, mm -hmm. which I think can charitably be called archaic. Uh, you know, <laughs> we, we look at the way that people are currently using technology and we, and uh, this can be anything from reg to lead retrieval to, you know, pre and post those surveys to everything else. And you see, you know, you can pretty much tell that it hasn't changed a whole lot in the last 10 or 15 years, right? Um, so that said, are there any new technologies on the horizon that you see could have a material impact on community connection, community formation? This could be 
platforms through which people are, are connecting with one another. This could be tools that people are using that you're starting to see or that you're investigating as, as ways to connect. Um, what do you see in that space as kind of a, a, something that could be impactful in 2024 and beyond? Yeah, I don't want to call out any names of companies, but I'll say the ones that are starting to put AI into the networking for the attendees to allow them to kind of review LinkedIn profiles or needs and resources that people have and put them together and say, I think you two would benefit from talking to each other without it being a sales relationship of I'm looking for this solution. I sell the solution, but much more of a connection opportunity. And whether that's in an event app or it even shows up as an email that comes to people that says, hey, these 10 people are coming to the event and I think you should reach out to them beforehand because they seem cool. Here's their LinkedIn profile, send them a message. You know, I think that that would be a really great way to bring people together. Um, we are, I will mention one um, tool that I think is really interesting. It's in beta, so I don't even know if they're letting more people in it. It's called Superhive, and it's a community-driven newsletter, which I think is it's cool because it's email-based. You don't have to be in an app or anything, and you send out like a call for submissions to your mailing list. People can then submit their request for help or their whatever it is that they need. You as the admin can approve it for the next newsletter, and then you hit send newsletter, and the, it sends out these requests from other people. So it's like the old message board, but it's in email form and people just answer it right there in the email. And I think it's it's an interesting technology. I think just like everyone else, we're all trying to deal with the email delivered deliverability problems, like it goes into junk mail and problems like that. But but seeing things that are truly letting the people connect with the people, I, I think has got to be the way to go. I think being part of the pilot of that, it's been really cool. It's how I found out about the telephone. I've had the Slack kind of back burnered. I can't stay on top of all the instant notifications. Community-based ones are the like bonus part of my day, not necessarily the core messages I need to be replying to. But as it came through email, I was able to scan it real quickly and mm -hmm. actually found that that worked better for me. And I never would have expected email to equal community like goals. Well, it's cool because we all call Slack asynchronous, but you know it's not. When that little thing pops up, they want it right then. So it's, you know, the email is much more asynchronous. You don't feel the urgency to be like, I must put my thing in that one immediately. So it, it's, a, it's a nice option. In this omni-channel world, running a community is nearly impossible because you have to have content and connection on 42 different platforms and be where everyone wants to be because you have to meet them where they are and it's very overwhelming. So I think just kind of narrowing it down and picking a few that are going to be the right ones for your particular community is important. Uh, well, Go ahead. Okay. So I was going to say how, I, you can't estimate this, but like how many hours does it take to run a community? Or like oh. how should, if a marketer is thinking like, I need to take a more community-based approach and we've done social marketing, we've done content marketing, we've checked a whole bunch of boxes. How do I achieve community marketing and what kind of resource is it? What kind of drain on my team is it going to be? It's scary to imagine that you're going to start it and then what, like abandon it six months in or something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is a stupid ass answer to your really great question, but it's, it's, it depends um, because like, what you put in is what you get out. I mean, there are some that are like, we put our community on a platform. We just let the community run and we go in there every once in a while and check on it. So people can do that and it doesn't take you much time, but that depends on the type of people that are in your community and how they're going to run it and, and be a part of it. I think the way that we view community is um, kind of a five pronged approach. You could view it as a funnel or you could view it as pillars or it ends up being a flywheel. And it's these just five elements to consider. And the first one is the show. What is your top of funnel community engagement show that allows people to come in like this? Are you doing a, a weekly webinar and conversation? Are you on TikTok? Are you, do, do you publish articles? What is it that allows people outside of your community to see what's going on inside of it? The next one is the site. What is that place that is asynchronous communication that lets people get together, whether it's your super hive or Slack channel or circle or a mighty network, but where can the people go in and find the people? It's not your company website. It's some sort of platform. It could be a free one, could be a paid one, whatever. The next one is the series of gatherings because your community has to gather, whether it's online or in person, you have to bring some group of them together. And even if it's just an advisory board of seven people, um, but you people want to meet. And so having that series of gatherings important. 
The next one is what we call a sounding board. And so if you can get five to seven, maybe 15 people together to really help you inform what the content should be in your show, where your gathering should be taking place, what the insights are that are going on in the in kind of your industry that you can bring forward, that's that sounding board. And then finally, the shareable moment. And that shareable moment is could be infographics, could be resources, could be the show that you're just sharing out, which turns it into a flywheel. So when you talk about going all in, if you're going to do all five of those things, well, you need some resources. You need you need to actually put people behind it and at least one person, right, full-time dedicated to caring about the community members. But if you're just going to pick one of those five and say, hey, all we do is this online community and it's just going to be, you know, a subreddit and we're going to bring people in, then you probably only need five hours a week, you know? Speaking of, of Reddit, um, th- that model, uh, you know, clearly is is the the model with the way that people can assign, um, you know, karma um, and up and down vote mm-hmm. different um, comments. And it allows for the first, the number one, uh, you know, feature that you had mentioned of, of uh, the model for we just put up, we check out the community, the community does its own thing. If you want the community to sort of self serve and to, uh, you know, create content um, and engage with each other. Um, I think some sort of incentive mechanism actually makes a lot of sense. And is that, um, you know, a model that can be applied to um, events and event tech, in your opinion? Ooh, an interesting question. Yeah, I mean, gamification is basically that. It's just using yeah. a scarier word for it that kind of right. diminishes its its value. But <laughs> but that's what it is. It's you know giving people either intrinsic or extrinsic reward to participate and be a part of something. So yeah. if you can identify who, what, which of those your participants are most likely to feel rewarded from and go yeah. all in, you know, the extrinsic reward. Well you know, sign up for a club EG membership and be entered to win a two night stay in Atlantis, Bahamas. Okay, there's your extrinsic reward versus sign up to become a community member so that you can share your expertise and really help other people because you're a chapter ahead of them and they need your help. Then you're going to, you know, promote the intrinsic. I love the way you broke that down because like in one sense, it feels really transactional and a little icky and not exactly, a, you know, community uh, focus and the other definitely feels that way where you're incentivizing based on, uh, you know, in, in, intrinsic, uh, non-transactional, um, you know, yeah. uh, incentives. And it just, that, that feels better. But also like we're using a tool called Snowball for event marketing for mm-hmm. this event that we're doing on Friday, which allows you to do, I don't want to call it viral ticketing, but it's, um, what would you call it? Like peer influence for something, because that's really why we go to events now. It's no longer FOMO. It's more um, influence of who else is going to be there. I'm not afraid of not being there. I'm afraid of not being around the other people that are being there. And so Snowball is this kind of both intrinsic and extrinsic. It's you register for the event and this thing pops up and says, hey, cool that you're going. Would you like to share it with your network so that other people can go with you? It's more fun with friends. And so now intrinsically, you're like, yeah, I want to share this cool thing I'm going to because it's amazing. And extrinsically, you're like, I look really cool because I'm going to this thing and I can go show everyone I'm there. Right. So I love the the technology that's coming through that's really helping people actually build their programs in addition to reward people. Right on. Well, I love uh, how real- you're acknowledging the, the cutting through the noise. It takes repetition. Mm-hmm. It takes everyone doing this. I, as I'm watching you promote the event you have coming on Friday, mm-hmm. every day you're taking a different angle to promoting it, highlighting different features and things like that. It It takes that much effort to cut through the noise and do promotion these days. It does. They used to say seven touches, right, in order for someone to even come close to making a decision. And I can't find research on it, but I swear to God, it's going to be 15 touches now. <laughs> we're just inundated with everything. And, and we talk about it's no longer about attention. It's about intention. And so how can you kind of break through? You still have to catch their attention, but how can you get to theirs, you know, what they really want? And a real quick room reset. If you guys joined us late, whether you were joining us on LinkedIn or X or YouTube or podcast or after the fact, uh, this is Gen City Labs, our twice monthly uh, LinkedIn live session. We are here with the fabulous Liz Lathan, co-founder of the Community Factory, talking about all things community and engagement. Um, Quick question, Liz, for you. Do you, how do you approach 
consumer communities. And so this could be a Comic-Con, this could be sports marketing, this could be, you know, your fans of like F1 um, versus enterprise communities, right? A developer conference. You mentioned IBM earlier. Um, what are the differences in terms of engagement? Do you use similar tactics between each because the core connection between people is similar or are there very, very different strategies given, you know, uh, very different audiences? I think um, there are, let's say, three types of community. And I think it's community of, let me see if I can remember what they are, community of practice, community of product, and community of purpose. And so I think that the, when you're in the corporate world, it's generally either practice or product. So you're building a B2B community around your product, either it's for customer service or it's for customer loyalty, or um, generally those are kind of the two to, to offset your customer service by letting the community come in and help answer technical questions. Or we've got this great group of customers and we really want them to stay loyal to us by giving them perks and VIP access and hoping they'll tell more people about it. So those, those options. Community of practice is like, let's say you sell HR software and you want to be active in something like a HR community, either you create your own or you're part of SHRM or something. And so it's people within the profession. And then on the consumer side, it feels a little bit more around purpose. So if you're at Comic-Con and you're doing a community around Avengers, you know, you're able to bring people to get together around this purpose and then put something in it so that you're moving them in the same direction. And it's less about we're a community of trading card people, which can be a community of product, which is a whole other thing. But kind of breaking it down that way doesn't necessarily matter B2B versus B2C. It's just figuring out the purpose of the community and what the people in it are trying to get out of it. And then what you want to get out of it, right? Because very few people create a community for altruistic reasons. There's a purpose. You're either trying to make money or you're trying to like solve your own problem. Sure. Man, I, and A, I cannot tell you how much I appreciate hearing the, just the, the, the way you're breaking this down. Hearing from an expert on community is very refreshing because we, we deal with a lot of communities. We deal with a lot of activations that bring communities together. Um, and we're really great at creating really compelling experiences. But man, having you talk about um, kind of the, the thought process and the strategy and the intent behind all of the experiences that are being built is really, um, really awesome and really refreshing. So thank you oh, for all thanks. of that. Um, MK, I think we might have another question from the audience. Yes. Also from Lauren, what's the best way for creative technology activations to build community on site and after an event? I want a little more clarity around this one. What does it mean by creative technology activations? So Lauren, if you can give us a little bit more, then I'd love to jump in there. Yeah, and I think I might be able to fill this in a little bit because this is somewhat of Gen City Labs' sweet spot of like where we play. And I think we're always so focused about the on-site experience and the in-person from the throughput of an activation and things like that. But I think the idea of building community, then actually leaving an activation feeling more connected is probably very mm -hmm. different than like putting on a headset and leaving like you had a solo experience. Mm. Okay. So are you talking about you've got an activation that's um, like, let's call it a hallway activation inside of a larger event? Or are you talking about you've got a booth and an expo hall or kind of- Could be. I, I think also talking about, you know, engaging big groups of people in an activity, right? That could be in a virtual reality headset, could be an augmented reality experience, could be big gamified experience, right? You've got a bunch of people competing or collaborating um, in some way, uh, you know, in general, that a, a lot of that is is what we're very focused on is creating those those moments and those experiences that are kind of educational okay. and fun. Um, okay. But how, you know, I, I think how do you parlay an experience like that into becoming a moment of recognition for a community? And it doesn't have to be that digital experience, right? It could be a special speaker. It could be a you know name your name your and, and I think this goes back to your show right? Like mm -hmm. yeah, a show within a show, right? Not necessarily the big thing, but like a moment. Um, how do you parlay that and extract the value out of it for that community? I, I think that if you're really driving for connection and community building, it's got to be the micro experiences that happen and breaking them down into smaller groups. So if you think about the Super Bowl or the Oscars, like these are the ultimate 
hybrid events that have been around for years and years and years. You've got what happens in person, which is in the arena or in the Oscars. They've got the red carpet experiences out front or the tailgate out front. And these are these moments for smaller groups to come together. At the Oscars, they're going to the after parties and they're doing all the personal stuff, but the after parties don't have all 40,000 people. They've got the smaller invite only groups and the tailgates and then the, the winning bar experiences that happen after the Super Bowl, like they're just smaller groups that break it down. And then you look on the virtual side, which is the people watching these things from home. You've got watch parties, you've got bar watch parties, you've got all these things. And so those little communities form around this one umbrella event. So I think when you're considering what you're going to think of the umbrella event and how you can pull out those smaller ones to have the shared moment. So if you think of watching the Super Bowl from a bar with a group of people who are all rooting for the teams and what happens in there is a very different experience than if you're sitting in the stadium with three people that are willing to spend $40,000 on tickets, right? <laughs> Yeah, I think sure. the theater nerd side of my brain starts to envision it like watching a play where during a slower scene, you might be taking more from the dialogue. I might be taking a second to appreciate the set or the costumes. And then all of a sudden a moment happens in the scene where a gun comes out and we all gasp because we all just experienced this collective moment together that was architected through the narrative. I think there's something really powerful about knowing when those moments are allowing for those moments of quiet reflection, self-processing, but then bringing them back together on the same page in a really yeah. intentional way. Yeah, I went to an event that their opening night party, I want to say there were 500, 700 people or so at the event and their opening night party was on the beach and there was this beautiful, they kind of built out this village on the beach thing. And it was the very first thing you experienced, but they didn't put in any plan for people to meet. You know, you had the food experience over here, there was a couple of bonfires and there was the bar and then there was the stage with the band. And so you go into this huge beach and you're like, okay, it's my first night here. I don't know anyone, I don't. And I just kept thinking, my gosh, wouldn't it have been cool if they had a big pile of sticks? And the first thing you had to do was go grab a stick. And then you had to pick which bonfire you wanted to put your stick on. And they had a bunch of small bonfires. And so you, your first job before you do anything else is to take your stick and go over and add it to a bonfire and meet the other 10, 20 people at that bonfire. And now you have all these little moments of light starting you off before you then either have a bartender come over to you or you go get your stuff. And, you know, just trying to break down the mega into the mini and doesn't have to take over the whole event. It's just those moments of community building. I feel I, like I'm having a weird psychological moment with having just watched the Squid Games competition show on Netflix. I don't know if anyone else is watching it. No, but the fact that we all collectively watched this show during COVID and we we're like, wow, that's a dystopian future. Then we actually just watched a reality show where they architected this, where everything is a test. Trust no one. Do not open that box. Do not hit that button. Don't do anything wrong. And I feel like that's almost a cultural moment happening right now that you can leverage putting people on the spot to make a choice like that, to live with consequences of an action, put themselves out of their comfort. We actually made a bunch of attendees play red light, green light at an event last year. So after Squid Games came in, you know, we didn't kill anybody, but yeah, <laughs> it was fun because we made every, it was in a keynote room, you know, we're like, hey, everybody get up. We're gonna use this space in the back and do something. I need 12 volunteers and we just play the game. Just get people moving for a second and then they can go back and do other things together. I love that you have filled in that moment of insecurity, anxiety, and uncertainty at the beginning of an event with like a mini quest, right? It's like, put your attendees on a little side quest just to get the ball rolling. They have a purpose. The stick, the bonfire, brilliant and, and, and simple. And, and it doesn't, it's not going to increase the budget, but it, it will increase the engagement. I love that. Well, here's the thing. People want to help and they want to contribute. Like we did an event in January of 2019. It was where we did a pop-up wedding in the middle of a corporate event. So mm -hmm. we had this venue that they, we asked them, they gave us the venue for free and we asked what they wanted in return. And they're like, well, honestly, we just want to be seen as a wedding venue. We need some wedding pictures. We haven't done anything with that. And we were like, well, we don't do weddings, but here's what we could do for lunch. Why don't we throw a wedding and we will make all the guests be the reception. And so we, we did our event stuff in the morning with all of our conversations. And then at lunchtime, we rolled out all this decor and flowers and all these things. And we said, all right, everybody, 
you are about to participate in a wedding, a real live wedding. There is a couple coming in at lunch to get married. I need you to set the reception, to set the tables. And so everybody was like, what? And they all got together and they set all the tables. It was beautiful. And then they went to the other room and there was this wedding and people were crying. They never met these people before. And they're like, oh my God, right? And then they come out and they have this reception. It was so fucking fun. That's so creative. (laughs) I love it. It makes me wonder, are there PR implications of doing this stuff right? It seems like that's the kind of stunt that can get coverage in marketing trades as being shaking up the status quo of events and stuff. Are people still leveraging that as a reason to get uh, engagement with with trades? I, you know, I guess we could. I think it's more about how do you engage the audience that you have there. You could definitely go bigger with it. You know, we we leverage partnerships and, and, and media to kind of bring in for that one. But it's more about what can you do that's going to surprise and delight your participants and make them talk about it. I mean, years later, people are still talking about this thing, right? right? I went to this event. There was a wedding there. I didn't know these people and I was crying. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> we also did an event that was a secret trip. We invited 80 experiential marketers to meet us at JFK Airport, bring a passport, pack for six days, 65 degrees. And we didn't tell them anything else. They showed up there and we revealed that we'd chartered a plane to Tuscany and we're whisking them away for six wow. days. And we did this whole spontaneous think tank with them with truffle hunting and pasta making. And, you know, and it was over the course of the six days now that happened in november 2019 we started a whatsapp group just to tell people the bus is coming to your villa the whatsapp group still has 50 people in it active every day talking to each other they're sending rfps through there they're wishing happy birthdays to each other like it's a real business community that formed and we heard anecdotally that over 25 million dollars in business has been done between the people that were on that trip together it was just like this is what happens when relationships transcend business I love that we've come full circle because Ron Graham started to mention that a little bit last week and we summoned you into the chat, I think, last week, uh, two weeks ago during our stream, because we were like, I feel like we're missing a piece of this story. Like, how did this come together? Why did people show up at the airport? Who are they? And what what brilliant mastermind is architecting something so random? So I feel like we now have a little bit of more understanding of what it took to get to that point. The idea was really just us saying, hey, events don't have to be boring. Stop it, people. Like we were in this rut and it was just the same old crap with the same old speakers. And we're like, what if you could actually do business not like that? And we tried this thing and then we COVID hit and then we couldn't do it for a little while. Um, and so now we're starting to bring it back with Club Ichi, which is for event professionals to kind of just break out of their bubble and break out of their rut. Like you're, it's not their fault that the events are boring. It's, you know, the the way that companies and executives want the things to flow. Like my, I must have my parade of presidents on stage and I must have, you know, all these things that need to happen. And that's fine. We have, you know, the ring to kiss, but there's other opportunities for us to pull in and make it much more dynamic than the executives think it has to be. And that's what that's what Club Ichi, that community for corporate event folks is all about. I love how you bring in the certain element of just authenticity and sincerity to create connections that clearly have have shown an, an incredible ROI. I mean, just the just the anecdote that you just shared. So the question is and the challenge there is how do you scale that up to a very large event or a very large community? Yeah, no, I think that it's it's scalable in in ways. And and that is kind of its omni-channel way. You know, I don't think you have to have a hundred thousand person event for your community to be labeled a success. I think that it is multiple opportunities throughout the year for your community to get together and connect. And so if you're dealing with the show, like I said, now that can get to your mass market of hundred thousand people while highlighting the people in your community and making sure that you're amplifying their eminence across the community and bringing them in. Meanwhile, you can do those series of gatherings for the large and the small bring them together. So Mm -hmm. Friday we're doing, we don't do a ton of virtual. We do bring people together, but we have sounding boards once a month where we bring people like 10 to 20 people together to solve a problem on zoom. And then Mm -hmm. this Friday we're doing this like, Okay, so we were thinking, oh my gosh, virtual events have gone back to nothing but talking heads and they're just not interesting anymore. And why would it, like no one will go to an event more than an hour. So I, I watch virtual events all day long and they're an hour here and there, but during the pandemic, we, we were doing 10 hour events, 12 hour events, like people would come to multi-day virtual events. No one can do that anymore. So we thought, why, why is that? It's because they, they suck. 
So on Friday, we're trying to make it not suck and prove that you actually can do something really long and fun. So we're doing this 12 hour long live broadcast with over 75 community members who are gonna contribute insights, content, prizes, ridiculous, stupid game. We actually have sessions called Play Stupid Games, Win Stupid Prizes. And, and it's, you know, conversations and, converse, and camaraderie and that's what it's all about. And you don't have to stay for the 12 hours because now we all know that you can record these snippets and put them in there and then you can use them on social and the long tail of content is real for the rest of the year. So I think that it's just, you have to think differently. It's a lot of work. Coordinating 75 speakers is not an easy task and having a production team. And we have the this better productions are coming down from Vegas and bringing all their stuff. And we're using a friend who has a studio in Phoenix and he's going to help us host it. And we're going to mm -hmm. be live there and piping people in from all over the world. But if you're willing to try, it could be really cool. So I just encourage people to, to try, you know? Love it. Amazing. We stop trying. You, uh, there's the way, fact that there's an ASMR I, session on the calendar for this. We I do. Love. We have a, two ASMR sessions. Slumu Institute, which is a, they make slime. They've sent us some videos of slime that, you know, it's a real thing. And then we have a calligrapher that um, we're picking some people to win prizes mm. and she's wood burning their name into these little uh, gifts that we bought. And so a five minute video on that where you can just zone out for a minute. It's so cool. Yeah. I hope my wife isn't watching because I I will lose her <laughs> to the. <laughs> you know, and by the way, if you guys are watching, whether live or remote, Liz is an awesome follow on LinkedIn and across socials. So please do make sure that you are tracking her down. We do encourage the participation for the telethon on Friday, uh, Liz. I'm sure you'll see a lot of us there. It Yay. sounds like a lot of fun, and I'll be in it. Yes, MK is in it. We have we have a really fun session called event. Can I say it? Yeah, do. <laughs> probably not. F ups. <laughs> oh, I love fail stories. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so here's my thing. So we're defining there's is it a failure, an F up or a faux pas? Right. So a failure mm. is something you tried for the first time. It didn't work, but you've learned something really good from it. An F up is when you got lazy or you cut corners or you didn't plan properly. And a faux pas is just a really embarrassing accident that you didn't mean to happen, but you can learn from all three. So we're going to have people telling their stories and then identifying which one it is. I love, love, love that. I honestly, at one point early in my career, thought that you could have an entire event around event fails and just learning from that. But I love the breakdown of three different totally. types. It was always just a, tell me your biggest failure stories because they're fascinating and fun. And, you know, the, the old adage, uh, time plus tragedy equals comedy means, uh, <laughs> you know, it's going to be really, it's, it's going to be really entertaining. Um, that's, awesome. that's, that's great. And I look forward to seeing, uh, Friday's Friday's schedule and calendar. So tell me, you know, with the community factory, what have been, and, and uh, I know we've been talking about a lot of our non favorite things, a lot of challenges that exist. Um, what, and, and you've told a couple of really cool stories about, uh, about projects you put together and you've been involved with. What have been some of your other favorite activations? Who have been some more trailblazing brands who have tried Ooh. new things that have really just been, you know, exceeded your wildest expectations? I think that I am really enjoying watching the companies that are trying to pull together playfulness and fun. And um, we, we learned a word today called kidulting, who's just like, you're letting the adults be kids again. And we're being, bringing in slides to the expo hall and we're having puppy parties and we're bringing playfulness back. So any of the brands that are really trying to inject that in. And I think that there's a fine line between um, a business event with a lot of fun and turning it into a carnival because some of them are going way too far and the entire expo hall is filled with all of these ridiculous games and there's got to be time for actually connection and learning. So, um, but putting those together and watching, you know, some of the stuff that happened at Money 2020 when they were bringing in all of these things and they're spending a lot of money in the expo hall, making it experiential. I think they could dial it back and make it more community focused and less about the craziness, but they're there, right? And so watching how that happens, I'm excited to see what happens with Dreamforce as it re-evolves because it used to be the Super Bowl of events with just oh, yeah. everything. And then COVID kind of dialed it back a lot. And now they're trying to figure out what city are they going to be in? How's it going to grow back? And what are they going to do? And I'm, you know, keeping an eye on that one to see where it goes. 
Um, so I think those big mega events are are so fascinating to me because people, you just naturally put it on your calendar when you think of your event strategy, right? You know the key events you're going to go to. The problem is with AI and all the video deep fakes and all this stuff, people are all touting events are the only authentic marketing left. It's the only thing that you can actually prove their people when you're with them in person. So now that means that our event strategies are like, kaboom, oh my God, we got to do 42 field events and we got to make a road show, go to 16 cities. And it, audience acquisition is just absolutely impossible because you can't not work for three weeks because you got invited to a bunch of events, you know? And so I think that that's going to be the biggest challenge is how do we dial back and have a real correction on the really key moments that people can go to or who is it we're bringing to these particular events in a smaller group, but for greater impact. And so that's, yeah. that's kind of what I'm looking at for 2024. I think 23 was um, the year of community. Everyone started one, like, let's do it. We're going to have 14 communities here. I'm on probably 30 Slack channels. It's ridiculous. There's no way to possibly keep up with it. So I think 2024 is when some of those communities die. So to MK's point earlier that you didn't resource it, the people have real jobs now or they laid them off. And, you know, there's nothing that we can do about the community anymore. So I think the correction will happen and the ones that have staying power will stay and they'll get their cadence. People will start putting together instead of let's do an event in 45 days. It'll be OK, we're going to do an event these four times a year so people can start planning again. I'm excited to see that come back. Yeah, it, it, it's I, I love your, your point there about kind of the over indexing in some areas. And, you know, you, you watch that pendulum swing and it's always you know, going a little too far in one direction when it trends. We, you know, we, we do work across the spectrum of enterprise, you know, dream forces and, and um, you know, your, your big Microsoft inspires and ignites and all the others and uh, all the way through Lollapaloozas and NFL Super Bowls and, and things like that. So I think we get a good cross section of major consumer events, major enterprise events, and, and you know, uh, agree with um, pretty much everything you're talking about. It's been, it has been interesting watching the kind of festivalization of the events space. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing that happen uh, more and more about the entertainment aspects kind of taking place and those engagement aspects. Uh, well, it's funny you mentioned that because I remember back in 2012-ish is when Oracle Open World really started making the evening mm -hmm. event a festival. It wasn't a yeah. single band. It was four bands. They took over yeah. Treasure Island. It became a, we did it at Dell World when I was there, you know, we turned, but, but it wasn't about festivalizing the event necessarily. It was about the evening part. And now, to your point, it's like make the whole event a festival. It's everywhere. And that's interesting. Yeah. But I still haven't seen that like that. It, it's funny because that networking component like every event that I've attended as an attendee or as a speaker, like I've, <clears throat> I've gotten way more out of waiting in a line or being in a green room with four other people um, or at the airport or on an airplane than I have from like the actual hosted networking happy hour events. Like it's just very, it, it's very interesting to see when I reflect, and I was talking with MK about this very recently, it's just like, I feel like I have always gotten more out of the ancillary side experiences that happen around the event than what the events have provided themselves. Um, oh yeah, those are the micro events though that we talk about. Yeah, right? no, 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 that's exactly yeah. right. That's why I love I, I love your, your statement on that because if there's a way to harness those, if there's a way to recreate those, if there's a way to organically help foster those moments, I feel like that can be very powerful. Um, and that can just be way more valuable for attendees across the board. Well, and understanding your attendee, your ICP, and being able to really kind of decide who's gen pop, like who do we not care about? They're just the people that bought the tickets and that they can just experience it and versus who are our level, you know, like you look at the community where as you move closer and closer into your inner circle and kind of plan those experiences outward. I think that we have to start doing our design more like that. Maybe just not naming them uh, networking. <laughs> I mean, step number one, we have had this conversation. What do we call them? We yeah. were trying to figure that out. Is Are yeah. they connection events? Because that right. sounds sketchy too. I don't know. No, I think, Shaven, you're onto something. It'll just be like 
the line experience of it. That's right. <laughs> the the you, airport. The line to nowhere. Creating <laughs> <laughs> awesome. queue, people waiting it because people like to wait in lines, or they see a line and they're like, "Oh, something interesting must be happening." And then be British, come queue. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I love it. Um, well, all right, we have just a few minutes here. If you have been following along uh, the Gen City Labs LinkedIn Live with special guest Liz Latham, we appreciate you guys. Um, in the last few minutes of wrap up, we love to do lightning rounds uh, around the horn. So uh, I will fire up a question and MK, I'm going to put you on the spot first. What has been the most effective networking experience? Not that you've organized though, it's got to be something from an event that you attended that still resonates with you today. So I know you I love. Actually, to, I, I know you love yes, being put on the spot. So, I just reread a LinkedIn article I'd written in March of twenty one. One year of COVID bullshit, hybrid uh, virtual events where everyone was like, "Oh, we're going back to live events, or we're going to do hybrid, and we're going to do hybrid perfectly." And my observations of what worked and what didn't work. And my favorite thing was those who offered virtual events that embraced the fact that you were at home. The idea that some events and experiences can only happen at home. You can't mirror the exact same experience for those in person and those remote. And so they offered things like Jonathan Adler redesigning your home office setting. Like you should be up and moving around and rearranging your office based on what this designer tells you or training your dog with a world famous dog trainer. And it sort of flipped my thing of like, oh my God, the chat and the participation and the experience of being in that is so groundbreaking compared to how's your wine? My wine's warm. I don't know. Like that could happen on site. Love it. All right, Eric, what do you got for us? I, you know, it's kind of boring, but it, it follows a bit about what you were saying it, the line experience. Um, and my most, you know, uh, deepest connections at certain events have been the people around me in the line, most recently at this uh, art event um, as, a, as a satellite to NFT NYC, um, I'm still connected with the people that were in front and the people that were behind me in the line. We hung out during the event um, and we still keep in touch. So don't discount the line experience. Well, there you go. Liz, what do you got? Bring us home. Okay, so it was at an industry association. They were trying to bring together the sponsors and give them more opportunity to connect with people. And they had planned out basically a progressive lunch with tapas. And so you get eight minutes at each table for the sponsor to talk about what they do or do a, a game or have an experience and you're eating there and then everybody gets up and not in your group, you are reassigned so you're not with the same people the entire time. You actually get to meet different people because the worst is they look good in Instagram, but when you go to those events with the really, really long table and you're stuck with one person on this side and one person on that side the whole freaking night. So this one allowed you to mix up the people, meet with the exhibitor and get a whole bunch of different food as you went around. It was beautiful networking. It was beautiful sponsor value. I loved it. Awesome. I got to say, I, I went to one recently that was not dissimilar. There was a speaker that was talking not necessarily about industry stuff, but it was more broad kind of societal changes and how technology is going to impact society. And you you ended up at a five person table with a breakout to talk about it, like big picture society stuff and they would rotate. And then there was a big dinner afterwards. But like that five person group of you know, you've got 10 minutes with these people and then we're going to switch it up and do 10 minutes with another group of five. There's something intimate about that. There's something impactful. Everybody has a chance to speak, table nominate speaker to present to the room. Like you end up in a room of 50 people, you end up, you know, meeting and knowing about half of them. And we kicked off the event. Like the first day of three days was that. So now you've got 25, 40, 50 people that you know at an event of several thousand people that you're going to see on a bus or you're going to see him at a hotel or you're going to run into him in a ballroom. Um, and, and I thought that the timing was great. And I thought that the connections were great. And, the, you know, Liz, back to your point, micro events, like very powerful, setting the tone and, and very impactful. Awesome. awesome. So uh, last house, last housekeeping. Once again, MK, you want to throw up Liz's event on Friday. Liz, this is uh, your chance one more time to promote it. So go fire away. 
All right, so Club Ichi is our community for corporate event professionals and the Club Ichi Telethon, 12 hours of conversation, content and camaraderie, live broadcast from 5 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific. It's just on, so you can jump in any point in time during the day. If you missed anything, it'll be recorded and you can go grab those afterwards. And it is event strategy, it's field marketing, it's trade show conversations, it's audience engagement, all the stuff. It's really going to be fun. We're having a blast planning it. And I think that energy conveys because if I'm not having fun planning it, you're not going to have fun watching it. So that's what this is all about. It's a celebration of community. Come join us. And Amazing. Great. Amazing. I will be there. I know a bunch of our folks will be there. Uh, Liz, we appreciate your time today. For those viewers watching, this is the last one of the year. We're uh, not going to do one. We're not going to try to jam one in between Christmas and New Year. So we will be back in early January with more fun topics about events, technology, brands, and more. Uh, so from the Gen City Labs team and Liz, thank you all for your time and attention. We'll see you next go round or we'll see you on Friday. Yeah, see you Friday. Thank you.